TV 18. Dr. Raghavanshi, thank you very much for hosting us at uh, your flagship hospital in India. I wanted to start by asking you that this this year has been marked by a recovery in the entire healthcare services space, especially hospitals. Currently, occupancies are doing well. There is a recovery post COVID-19. Uh, can you tell us where things stand? Yes, you're right. Uh, recovery uh, is happening, uh, but not only recovery, it is uh, uh, taking over the pre-pandemic levels, the, the growth levels. And uh, that was expected because last two years have been a little muted and we would expect that uh, at this point of time we would see some growth. Uh, for example, in the international patients, we are seeing the growth much higher than the pre-pandemic level. Uh, occupancy levels currently have come back to about 70%. Okay, so I'm just going to get to the international revenue bit in uh, just a bit, but I just want to focus on the occupancies. They've come back to 70%, but how much of it is actually pent-up demand? I don't believe there is any more pent-up demand. We saw it in the first quarter that some of the specific procedures, like for example, the joint replacement procedures, they went up abnormally high, mm. uh, but that sort of settled down within two months. Mm. Uh, and now we see that all the specialities have come back to a similar uh, pattern as it was pre-pandemic level. So my belief is that uh, whatever uh, pent-up demand was there has already been taken care of. So whatever growth we are seeing today is true growth. Okay, so what do you think has changed from uh, COVID-19 to now? Because you're saying that pent-up demand is probably out of the way now. So what has changed in terms of health awareness in India? So obviously, uh, insurance penetration has gone up because of the awareness levels of uh, how, how, you know, healthcare can be devastating for economic expenses for the family. So that has happened. Another thing which has happened is that a lot of simpler procedures or uh, routine procedures are today happening in periphery, mm. uh, in smaller hospitals mm. uh, all across the country. And more and more complex uh, cases which require more attention and, and are typically uh, uh, much uh, uh, sort of uh, complex are coming to hospitals such as ours. Okay, so there is more complex procedures which are coming in, more insurance penetration which has taken place post COVID-19. Occupancies, like you said, have moved up to around 70% versus around say 65%. Uh, where do you expect it to probably sustain? So we expect to go to about 75%, uh, but there would be always uh, variations. Uh, so there are cyclical variations through the year. The festival season typically would, uh, would see a suppressed uh, occupancy number. Like for example, in the fourth quarter, typically we see the occupancy dip a little bit. Uh, but overall, I think we expect it to be around 75% plus. Okay, what about the average revenue per occupied bed? Where does that stand currently? So that is interesting question because uh, the average realizations have remained high and quarter on quarter you would see that there has been some growth and that is not because of pricing. The pricing changes we haven't done for nearly two years. You uh, haven't changed prices. We haven't for changed years. prices for almost two years. So you're seeing more volume growth. We are seeing more of equity growth. As I was saying earlier, the complex cases are coming more and more and that is increasing the RPOP significantly. So where and does it stand currently? It stands at about 1.9 uh, crores uh, on an annualized basis. And I expect it to rise from there further because sooner or later we will have to do some pricing corrections as well. When do you think this pricing correction can come? Uh, we are thinking more in terms of the next financial year, early next financial year. And would that be for more of the complex procedures? Because your surgical revenues have done extremely well. It's at all-time highs. Uh, is that where the price hike will probably come through? Uh, it would be across the board. Uh, uh, it would, uh, but it would be modest, I would say. So what is modest? Sub 5%, 5 to 10%? Uh, sub 5%. Sub 5%. Sub so 5%. price hike of sub 5%. Yes. But um, the other aspect of healthcare, which is actually... 
uh, quite obvious now within the entire private healthcare space is um, actually capex. A lot of hospitals are either undergoing brownfield capex or they're making some kind of acquisitions within the entire space. Uh, according to Fortis, what's your plan? Because you all have been a little bit on the back foot when it comes to aggressive capex. Yeah, I, I would actually slightly disagree there. Uh, we have been doing almost 300 crores of capex in last three years, every year. Mm -hmm. And we did not uh, sort of uh, reduce that uh, even during the COVID phase. The reason is that there was a lot of uh, pent up uh, uh, demands in terms of, you know, upkeep of the infrastructure, replacement, capex, etc. So now that is behind us. And now we are more focused on the further growth. One of the major areas which we are focusing on for growth is brownfield expansion. And that is very much on track. As you would have come into the hospital, you would have seen that there is a major construction site. So overall, we are increasing approximately about 1,400 beds. Uh, some of those beds have already been added. Uh, the rest would come online in next two years, uh, some, some in the coming year and, and, and rest in the following two years. Will it be across India? It is across India, mainly in NCR, but also in Mumbai and Bangalore and Kolkata as well. But do you think NCR is probably a market which is seeing extreme amount of supply now? Not really. It is, uh, one has to understand that NCR in itself is a very large market. Mm -hmm. It's seeing phenomenal growth in terms of both population and infrastructure being put up. Mm -hmm. And then it serves a large hinterland as well. Mm -hmm. And as I was saying earlier, the complex procedures, the more uh, demanding surgeries, those will always have uh, typically gravitate towards NCR. And as a result of that, the quaternary care kind of hospitals such as this one uh, would always get larger volume. In my view, the NCR region can absorb much uh, larger capacity than what it already has. And mind you that there is uh, further capacity coming in the public sector as well, which is required to. So IHH, uh, you know, there's been so much of a stop and start when it comes to the open offer. And that's the reason why I brought up that maybe y'all are not pressing the accelerator okay. when it comes to aggressive capex. Is that the case? Not at all. In fact, other than the organic expansion, which I have mentioned to you, we are actively pursuing other opportunities as well. Acquisitions. Uh, which would probably be brownfield kind of uh, hospitals, which may, may be functional, may be dysfunctional. Uh, I can't really talk too much about those right now, but we are uh, evaluating those projects as well. And we do have capacity in spite of the legal constraints we have capacity to grow further. Our debt ratio is very comfortable, uh, so we can have a lot of leverage, and that gives us an ability to look at at least about 1,000, 2,000 bed acquisition inorganically as well. But we want to sort of place it over a period of time rather than... So what uh, would be the size? Uh, we can go up to 1,000, 1,500 beds. beds. Yeah. Okay. And the region? Uh, region, uh, preferably, we would like to enhance the presence within the regions we are within, the clusters we are present, or alternatively, if there is a new cluster. But there has to be a, a significant presence and density of hospitals, beds within a given geography, because that gives the advantage in terms of uh, clinical talent, managerial talent, supply chain uh, synergies, and all that is very important. So we always want to grow in clusters. Okay. So our Punjab cluster, for example, we have three hospitals. If there's something which is complementary and synergistic to those, that is what we will like to do. The open offer that has been delayed for around four years now. Um, the reason I'm asking about IHH, you might have a good debt to equity. You might be wanting to uh, undertake a lot of capex and you know grow aggressively, but. Is IHH entirely committed to Fortis uh, despite the open offer being delayed for so long? See, IHH has made it abundantly clear recently 
that uh, they are absolutely committed to Fortis and India as a market. Uh, so that uh, commitment is absolutely there, both in spirit and in, in, in actions. So they are very involved. We are doing multiple uh, uh, things together. Uh, we are working on our digital platform, for example, which is totally with the support of IHH. Mm -hmm. And there are many other areas where we are uh, collaborating with uh, IHH. So all that is certainly there. We also believe that as far as this uh, open offer issue is concerned, uh, the Supreme Court order has probably removed that but there are certain ambiguities. So those need to be clarified. We strongly believe in the, hell, uh, in, in the legal system of the country and we expect that this will get resolved sooner or later. But that doesn't stop us from growth uh, and that doesn't stop us from even going for acquisitions. But would they want to be acquired? The speculation is that, you know, we might as well be committed to India through another uh, through another vehicle and maybe not Fortis. Do you think that IHH would probably sell their stake to another company in order to just relieve themselves of the frustration of the open offer delay? No, IHH has invested itself heavily into uh, in, into Fortis. Uh, they have helped Fortis come out of such uh, difficult situation. So there is no reason why their commitment will go down. And they have made it abundantly clear in their recent uh, press interactions as well that they are absolutely committed to Fortis. And they are going to make this platform much bigger. IHH's goal of, you know, uh, growth for good and, and care for good is something which uh, is very much imbibed into Fortis today. And IHH's commitment at all the levels, whether be it at board level or even at the operational level where we come, we sort of uh, collaborate on quality issues and uh, clinical quality issues, uh, digital, as I mentioned, and many other areas, supply chain. So all those uh, synergies are there. And this is not a short-term relationship. This is not uh, simply a commercial investment from their side, if I can speak on their behalf. Uh, their commitment is absolutely there. There are a lot of your peers, such as Apollo, which are really stepping on the gas when it comes to digital. Um, I wanted to understand what your plans are. Would you look at an omni-channel play? Would you look at e-pharmacies? Is that a route of growth? See, our first emphasis is on improving the experience of patient as it is. So the services we offer, we don't offer pharmacy services, for instance, yeah. today. Yeah. So if we were to get into that business line, that will be a new thing for us. Yeah. Yeah. So we are not thinking of those areas. Of course, those can be considered at a later stage. But today, the focus of digital is to improve the experience, improve the efficiency, and make it better for our patients okay. and our physicians as well. So it's not something which is a big revenue generator, the digital uh, piece that you're talking about. So how we, I look at it is that the digital is a, a kind of a channel which has become very important. Mm -hmm. So that is growing. Mm -hmm. The number of patients who interface with us on a digital medium is very high. Uh, so that number is continuously growing as high as about 35% of our patients today interact with us on a digital medium, either our app or, or the website or, or any other medium. Okay, but you're not going to be an aggregator per se as of now. See, we are not into that business today, but tomorrow, who knows? Okay, the other piece, um, you know, which stands out and you did mention it earlier is basically medical tourism. There is a big emphasis from the government as well with regards to heal in India when it comes to medical tourism. How much is international as a percentage of sales? You all have grown over 100% in the first half itself. So that's doing well. But what is the potential? So currently it's about 10% of the revenue uh, in terms of our overall revenue. But because our revenues have grown, pre-pandemic also it was 10%. I expect it to go higher to, uh, to about 12 to 15% over the next one and a half, two years. Uh, the international potential is huge. And as you mentioned, Heal in India is going to bring in a kind of transparency in, in the interactions. And because of that, uh, the, the, the 
flow of patients to organized sectors such as ourselves is going to improve. So that definitely is an area which uh, we are looking at. But what do you think might be the biggest challenge? So one of the challenges is the general infrastructure in healthcare. Uh, the, not necessarily the hospital infrastructure, but the social infrastructure which people need, the travel related infrastructure, the stay for patients, other entertainment and other soft social infrastructure around the hospitals. That is one area which uh, definitely uh, is a challenge. But do you think that we could probably give, uh, you know, countries which are as, as strong when it comes to med medical tourism, um, a run for their money? You know, the Turkeys of the world, the Singapores of the world. We always will, because the cost advantage which India is offering is much much higher than than any other uh, country. So I that that's why I don't like to call it tourism, but it is value travel, mm -hmm. and that is happening from countries where people have economic uh, disadvantage as well, and they don't have the infrastructure as well. Mm -hmm. So that kind of work will keep on coming. Another pattern which is which we are observing is that some of the uh, countries which used to send very uh, simple procedures and common procedures earlier are now sending more and more complex work because they have got the basic infrastructure, they have got good diagnostic facilities. So conditions are getting picked up and they are coming in time here. So that segment would continue to grow. You mentioned diagnostics. Um, SRL has been an important and integral part of the business, uh, but the PEs have been wanting to exit for quite a while now. Um, it's been even pre-COVID. When do you think they will probably exit? Do you think that you'll maybe go for an IPO? So we have uh, had an uh, arrangement where we had entered into a new agreement with the PE providers, uh, so, so pre-investors, uh, where we had... Uh, uh, agreed to a situation where by 2024 mm -hmm. we would either go for an IPO mm -hmm. or we would have an alternative mechanism of, mm -hmm. of the acquiring these uh, uh, their uh, shares. Uh, so that plan is intact. Uh, of course, uh, if 2024 we have to go for uh, 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 listing, uh, then we have to start preparing next year. Uh, so we definitely would... If they uh, find an exit, will you still list? If there is, an, uh, uh, there is an alternative path, then obviously listing will not be there. Okay, so maybe there could be a listing yes. for SRL by 2024. Yes, yes. because we, we strongly believe in that business mm -hmm. and we believe that it can be built, the further value can be built out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we... Were but the margins business. are lower than uh, peers. Yeah, so see, this business has grown uh, through acquisitions and uh, uh, over the years. We were one of the early start uh, starters. So now uh, there are a lot of initiatives we have taken. We are increasing the presence of our contact centers, our places where we can uh, take samples from. And at the same time, we are also working on making efficiencies and rationalizing the lab network, for instance, uh, improving the TAT, improving the digital experience, improving the home collection piece. Those are some of the areas with on which but we are working. Where do you see margins, to, uh, margins going for SRM? See, it has become an area which is uh, slightly competitive. Uh, and because of that, uh, the margins are under a little bit of pressure, but we expect them to be about 20%, about in the range of about 22, 23%. But slightly competitive uh, right now, you know, you have online aggregators, you have other hospitals, you have standalone labs really clicking at your heels at this point. How difficult is the diagnostic business? No, I uh, look, you know, whenever a business evolves and there are too many players come with differentiated models, there will be a little bit of pressure. But if you see already these, there is some degree of rationalization which is settling in, in especially in terms of pricing. You cannot have a model which is exclusively based on discounting. So that is changing and because that is changing, uh, we are seeing that the pressure is relenting. Uh, how much it has relented? 
uh, is for all of us to see, but definitely some of the steam of that early uh, exuberance. The is, hundred is rupee test. But do you think that uh, it's in a, you are in a situation where you can eventually take some price hikes when it comes to diagnostics now? Uh, see, we have maintained the prices. Through all this situation, the prices have not gone down. Okay. Uh, so that itself, in my view, is a good thing. Uh, because in any industry, the aim is to get the prices down. Uh, especially in a consumer-facing industry like diagnostics. The idea is to keep the prices where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but some degree of rationalization will be required. Maybe some of the tests would cost higher and some of the tests may cost lower. You said you're comfortable in terms of debt to equity. You all are looking at some amount of expansion uh, in terms of the hospital business. Overall, any fundraising on the cards? So that is a little bit of constraint at the moment because of the legal issues and we don't require that much of funding. But if there was to be an attractive acquisition uh, which comes our way, then obviously we will explore. But that would be entirely through debt? Uh, it could be a mix of words. Okay, so you could look to tap the equity markets yeah, in case. It, it is possible. Okay. Uh, say we have to, you know, have this discussion two to three years down the line. Give us a sense in terms of where you envisage the hospital business to be and where do you expect the diagnostics business to be? Two to three years, the hospitals would definitely be about 35% bigger and uh, probably uh, uh, we, would con we would certainly have an EBITDA of about 25% by that time. Uh, as far as the diagnostic business is concerned, again, we expect a growth of about 8 to 10% year on year.